Life is going to knock you down. Do you stay down or do you get back up? On this episode, we're going to talk about how your story affects your ability to be resilient. But before we jump in, I want to remind you to please subscribe and share. And if you'd like to get in more deeper, meaningful conversation, you can join my private Facebook group called Victoriously Living. And if you'd like to see more from One Leg Up Productions, please support us at patreon.com forward slash One Leg Up Productions. Hi, welcome to Chair Chats, the lifestyle talk show with the disability twist. I'm your host, Pauline Victoria. Being resilient is not a foreign concept to our guest. Alvin Law was born without arms, was given up by his birth parents, and was doubted all along the way throughout his life. But he found the key to being resilient is in the power of changing your label and rewriting your story. Alvin, thank you so much for being with us on Chair Chats today. I'm so excited about having our audience get to know you because in the conversation we had prior to this in, to this formal interview, I just felt elated after speaking with you. I felt so good about myself. And I'm like, wow, how does he do that? How does he make you feel so good about yourself knowing that... You were born without arms, you were given up by your birth parents, and I'm sure there were many naysayers who really doubted what was possible for you. Um, And you have a great gold cast video on your website, alvinlaw.com, that people can take a look at to get to know you better. But I was really touched when your mom said, um, she practiced self um, tough love. And my parents practiced tough love on me too. And I really feel like it was the key ingredient in helping me give this, give me the space to realize my potential and see what I was truly made of. Um, because when we were born with limb differences, um, you know, so, so drastically, I mean, let's face it, we're, <laughs> the cards are stacked up against us, right? And so- yeah. We have choices to make about, do we allow the deck of cards to be bigger than us or do we rise above the deck of cards and see like, oh, we can play with those too, right? So I would love to allow our audience to get to know you better. So if you can just give our audience some insight about who Alvin Law is. Well, you know, I will tell you this, uh, Pauline, uh, this is a delight for me. Um, I, I think it truly fascinating that you are doing these interviews and I've never been interviewed by somebody with your body condition before in my life. Um, I've talked to people like you, but not like this. So good for you. Good for you also for deciding that we need to have more presence in media. You know, this whole idea of uh, being represented, we hear about it all the time, right? From, from different minorities. They, they feel a lack of representation in, in reading books, media, television shows. I get that. And by the way, just a little sideline to that before I go on about me. One of the things that I want people to understand is when you're the minority, that isn't always a bad thing. And I believe that a lot of the reason that we're having the conflict that we're having right now, not to timestamp this interview, is because people have not learned, in my opinion, to acknowledge that we all have something to get over. You got over yours, how? Well, because you didn't know any different. I like to say to people when they ask, what happened to you? I mean, I'm sure you've heard that a few times, huh? I used to go through the entire answer because I want to acknowledge and honor people. But after I met my wife, Darlene, and I'll talk about her later, (laughs) the new answer is nothing. What happened to you? Nothing. Oh, come on, something must have happened. No. I was born this way. Nothing happened. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't a tragedy. 
And if that sounds like I'm saying it because it would be a good thing to say in an interview, the answer that I have to that one is I became a motivational speaker after I developed this attitude. And I wouldn't have had this attitude if I wouldn't have had the beginning of my life go the way that it went. Pauline, I have a, a, an almost unique circumstance in the sense that I was able to see what my life might have been compared to what it turned out to be. And in that, I mean, I met my birth family in 1993. That was intentional, not for me. I did not need to know my birth family. I was not mad about it. I wasn't bitter about it. I say in my speeches that I was homeless at five days of age because it's true. People are shocked. How could anybody do that? Because it was 1960. Okay, and I, that's a significant part of my story. We did not have the internet. We did not have a lot of research, if any, on people born without limbs. The only knowledge there was in medicine were the people that had been, uh, you know, wounded in World War II en masse, losing limbs to explosions. We didn't know anything else. So my birth family sounded like they were bad people. That is, in fact, the opposite. They were incredibly great people, but they were so scared. They were so uh, intimidated. They were not given any window of hope by the medical community. Everything was stacked against me for real and you too. So you always talk about your parents. It's not a coincidence, Pauline, and I want to say this. I also want to acknowledge that not everybody gets to have the parents that you and I had. And I mean that for everybody in the population. There is absolute research that shows what we grow up with determines our future. But I also want to acknowledge that a lot of people grow up in a tough circumstance and go on to be remarkably successful. I love LeBron James's story, right? Look, at he's a perfect example, right? Now, a lot of people don't like the LeBron James story because they, they coin him as just one off. Well, he's just one guy. If you don't play basketball and you're black, you won't succeed. That's narrow-minded thinking. It may be cr true, but in my opinion, it's narrow-minded because what we forget is our circumstance can be changed with our attitude. We don't need to have that support, but we need to acknowledge it and then believe in it and again, we're going to talk about a lot of things today, Pauline, because there's a lot of things to talk about. But when I grew up, I never thought of myself as handicapped, ever, until I got to be an adolescent. And then it became a convenient excuse, right? Which is another touchy issue for people when they're called out for using their challenge as an excuse or a blame game. We hear that all the time. I wasn't allowed to blame the drug thalidomide, which is how I was born this way. I wasn't allowed to blame the world on how it looked at me. I wasn't allowed to blame my lack of arms on not being accountable around the house. I had chores, all the chores. I was making my bed at you know, six years old. I was helping my mom do laundry at 10. I was mowing the lawn at 12. I was shoveling snow in Canada at 13. I mean, my God, there was times I'd look at my parents and go, you don't love me, do you? No, they only took me home from the hospital when they were 55 and 53-year-old foster parents. They, that's all they did was love me. But sometimes love doesn't look real pretty. Sometimes love is tough. And that's exactly how it turned out to be this way. You and I have so much in common, Pauline, and I just love it. Me too. And I'm so grateful that we were able to live to the time where we have the technology to connect, right? Like you're in Canada, you're in Calgary, Canada, in your summer cabin, which a family summer cabin overlooking the lake, I know it's hard for our audience to see, but across in that through that window is a deck overlooking a beautiful lake. And I'm here in Hawaii and we're able to connect and not just superficially, but really mind to mind and heart to heart. And hopefully our audience will be able to get to see that. And that's what I love to do is to bring stories to my audience that allows them to see um, what's possible in this world. And so um, tough love is, you know, I think more than anything, love is tough. Love should be tough, right? It's not easy. I mean, you're married. You said you have a beautiful wife. I have a husband. Yeah. And yeah. as much as we love them, Alvin, let's get honest. Marriage is one of the hardest, hardest things we have to do, right? Like it's, it takes, you have, you throw two human beings who are committed to each other to live this life 
together, you're bound to run into some friction, right? And so, um, do you want to speak about your wife now, or do you want to save sure. that for later? Oh no, I'd love to talk about my wife now, and 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 I hate to correct the host, but in fact. My home is in Calgary now for 20 years, oh, but where you. I am is in a place called Crystal Lake, Saskatchewan. Say that twice, Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan. It is the middle prairie province in Canada. It is the main farming province in Canada. And I was born and grew up 45 minutes south of here in a little town called Yorkton, Saskatchewan. Because of the proximity of this lake, there's many in the area. My parents started coming here in 1948, not this building. Uh, my parents' cottage is about six cottages away. So we're on the same side of the lake. This is a very tiny lake. And I apologize for a little bit of the brightness behind me, but I wanted to have it as my backdrop because I wanted to explain how powerful this community was for me growing up. I'll get to Darlene in a minute. In fact, Darlene's story is a part of this lake. When I was a baby, my mom and dad would come out here. My mom would actually move us out here to the cottage for the summer. Once I started school, uh, it would be the beginning of July. We wouldn't go back until just before Labor Day in September. I spent my summers out here exploring my abilities, okay? Because nobody out here cared that I had no arms. Everybody loved my parents, so everybody loved me. I was like this little token boy around the lake that everybody loved and everywhere i went there were free cookies there was kool-aid there were stories there was exploring there was swimming without arms there was fishing this place however was very rustic we didn't have power we didn't have running water we had to use an outdoor biffy we called them with a hole in the in the toilet seat that i was terrified of falling down because i couldn't save myself with my arms that didn't exist can you imagine that nightmare <laughs> So it was the kind of place, exactly. It was the kind of place that you either loved or hated. So I should have had a, I should have had a hint when my first marriage didn't last because my first wife hated this place. That should have been a clue. We divorced when he, my son was two years old. It was a marriage of uh, not convenience, a marriage of, of necessity because we were both from Christian families. You can't have a child out of wedlock, God forbid. So. We got married. The marriage was terrible. I survived that. And then I became a single dad. This is all part of Darlene's story because it's a very important part of it. And when I met her, these were the words that were exchanged between her, who was the co-chair of a conference I was speaking for in Edmonton, Alberta. My wife was a, a coordinator of adult education in the province of Alberta. She and another lady were putting on this conference. They, they hired me to speak. We had never met. And when we did meet, her words to me, the first ones were, you're staring. I said, I'm not staring. She goes, and you're drooling too. I wasn't drooling. Apparently, I could not stop looking at this woman, okay? I was lucky to meet this person that I instantly fell for. I agree there can be a physical attraction, but sometimes a physical attraction going the other way surprises folks. I know why I was attracted to my wife. She is beautiful physically. Of course, that's not what defines her. But I like to joke, why did she find me attractive? I don't think it was the biceps, <laughs> okay? <laughs> what she found attractive was that, you, you talk about the, the, the theme for today, my resilience is what blew her away. I was a single father of a five-year-old. I was traveling as a speaker. I was having my parents look after my son whenever uh, her mother, his mother wasn't available, which was most of the time. And when I met Darlene, she was also at the end of her own marriage to a police officer. He was the expression of masculinity. She had him for nine years. He was a, he was a stud. I've seen pictures of him. But do we know any men that are studs and they're not nice people? That's what he turned into. It wasn't the way he was when they were married. And I don't want to make this about policing because that's the hot topic right now. But that's exactly what happened to him. He was not the same person because of what he'd seen. He wasn't violent with her. He didn't abuse her. But he was not growing as a human being. And a lot of it had to do with what he saw every day in the police force. My wife was about growth, thus her involvement with adult education. So when we met and I spoke and I used the words to the Adult Education Conference of Alberta, 
because these are all adult learners. The line is you only get one life and you're never too old to learn a new idea. Mm. You're never too old to start a new life. Those words got in her head. And six months later, we were living together. Way to, <laughs> way to ride in in your knight in shining armor and your horse and just sweep her away. <laughs> yeah. And, and before I forget, the key to this whole story was she had to come from Alberta to Saskatchewan where I was living and she had to meet my family and she had to spend the weekend at Crystal Lake. Well, by this time we had an indoor toilet, thank God. <laughs> when she fell in love with Crystal Lake and by the way, my son, that's what, that's what, that's what Ace did. It was, it was just this joy. And when Pete, you're right. You know what? People see us together and they go, oh, you guys are always smiling. No, we're not. We have pretty good fights, Darlene and I, because she's a very powerful, willful woman. And what she hates the most is being treated like she's stupid. Mm -hmm. Her dad did that. And also her ex-husband did that. So I don't do that. But sometimes I say something dumb because I'm a man and she gets upset. We have these fights, but we're also going to be celebrating our 27th wedding anniversary in three weeks, July 2nd, 1993. We got married. Wow. So yes, but there's a tale here, and you figured this one out too, my dear. Marriage is like anything else. You need to practice, you need to work hard, you need to have open communication, but here's the key. You need to respect the other individual. And too often what I think happens, and I've seen this, I don't want to sh jump ships to another topic here, but why is the divorce rate so high in our Western world? I believe it's because people do not bother to work hard at the marriage because it's easier just to leave and move on. But I also think people, some people, don't age well. They don't look like they did when they were 21 years old. So by the time they're 40, especially men, they look at their wife and go, geez, you're not the woman I married. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, she is. And I think that's probably part of the problem. I don't want to become sounding like some perfect person here, Pauline. But I think the bottom line, honest to God, is if anything in the world, if you work on, what did Malcolm Gladwell say in his great book, um, 10,000 hours spent practicing something makes you a master? Exactly. Apply that to not only marriage, but your own personal life. Right, right. And this idea of resilience goes to what you were saying, you know, moving from marriage to applying it to all their parts of our life of it's easier just to give up. And instead of going for that dream job or dream business or, you know, whatever that goal is, it's easier to sit on the couch and watch Netflix and binge on some shows. Right. Well, yeah. And Pauline, one more thing while you hit on, on a point I want to make before I forget. We also live, especially in the Western world, in a right now society. We live in a fast food mentality. We forget that sometimes things take a little while. I'll always remember, this was such a silly example, but my wife and I were working in the United Kingdom and I, we'd gone to Dublin. And a young man that I knew who's a filmmaker uh, took us around his hometown of Dublin and we ended up the afternoon at the Guinness beer plant. Boy, that's a fascinating place to go. And the reason I mentioned it is because there's a museum that you go through. It's seven stories high, this place. And the entire top of the Guinness plant uh, museum is uh, glass. So you have an entire view of the city of Dublin at evening. It's beautiful. But at one point, you go through how they made the barrels, which is the key to how Guinness gets its taste. And it took seven years for someone to apprentice making a wooden barrel before they were allowed to make a barrel by themselves. Seven years. And back then, nobody went, I'm not going to wait seven years. Nowadays, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful, even older people do this, but we've gotten so used to Amazon delivery. Just dial it up and it shows up at your doorstep. Life doesn't work that way, Pauline. Yeah. Yeah. And and you shared a quote with me before we started this interview that I feel like speaks to that particular point. You want to share that? Yeah. What uh, uh, I was talking about this beautiful cottage of ours. And again, this is our place. We've had it for a long time. Uh, and uh, a buddy of mine that I went to high school with, I had posted some photos to say, this is our new view for the summer. 
and my buddy wrote this post. He said, blessings of hard, the blessings of hard work. And that's exactly what this is. This, I didn't just buy this one day because I felt like it. I put aside money. I dedicated a budget. My wife is the one who runs our finances. We made a huge investment. And this place continues to become not only better than we bought it, but also it's, I got to be honest, okay? I, I know anybody would love this place. I know anybody would feel resilient here because you're going, oh, I'm so lucky. But it's more than that. Uh, one of the things that Darlene also is in my life, and we mentioned this in our pre-call, is she's uh, one of very few in Canada called a feng shui master. A feng shui, of course, is a very old uh, thing that was invented in Asia. A lot of people call it New Age. Yeah, it's only 6,000 years old from <laughs> Japan and China. And it was invented to allow people to have more um, sort of nature indoors, if I can describe it in my own naivety, all right? So this place is absolutely stunning. Of course it is, but it's more than that. It's not just a beautiful location. There's a calmness here. Okay, I'm wearing this shirt on purpose today, on purpose, because how blessed are we twice? We also have a timeshare on the ocean in Kauai. And the first time that I went to Hawaii, I felt something. I couldn't describe what it was. But then everyone kept saying aloha, and I thought it was just a nice greeting until I begin to understand what it actually means. This is what I'm talking about. The spirit of aloha is what has given me what I've got in my life. Hard work, determination, resilience, but celebrating my life every single day because the, the alternative to that would be what we're seeing so much of right now in our modern society. So many angry people, so many bitter people, so many people looking to blame their problems on something that happened to them. I understand that. I'm not trying to make light of it. But you and I both know lots of stuff happened to us. We should be angry. We should be hostile. We should be upset. Why aren't we? Because we choose the spirit of aloha. Yeah. Yes. And I wanted to bring that back in your speeches, videos, website, your book. We're going to talk about that a little bit. But I want, you know, you talk about changing the label and writing your story. Right. And so, um, and you have to choose that. Our story doesn't happen to us guys. It doesn't. Um, we co-create, we create our story, rewrite it. We are the authors of our story. And it's hard because when we don't like to see what the story is, it means we have to look at the writer, right? When we, Absolutely. Read, when we read the book, if you don't like the story, you blame the author. And we're the authors of our stories. And I know for some of us, that's really hard to swallow because we don't like the story we're reading or, li or living into. Um, so I wanted you, Alvin, you, what you just said was so perfect because it's, it's cho choosing. We exercise our power to choose to live from a, a different space and right. aloha. Um, and so can you speak to what does that mean? How, did, how does one change their la label? So let's personalize it. If sure. there's someone watching this right now yep. and their label was, I can't, their label was life is too hard. Their label is the system is against me. How, how does one begin to even change that story or that label? Okay, so I'm going to tell an old story, and I'm going to say something that I hope doesn't offend anybody watching, but I'm just going to say it because I'm real honest. When I uh, think back to my youth, and that we all kind of go through that adolescent angst, right? There's no question about it. But the first element of the answer, Trace, or Pauline, is that but my parents didn't allow me to walk around brooding. It, they, if you met them, you would have fallen in love with them too because they were just these life lovers, yet they were very hard workers, very, very. Don't forget, my parents were married in 1930, okay? That put, just to put a spin on that one. So the greatest gift they gave me was at 18 years old, I moved out. I moved 800 miles away to Calgary where I'm living now, and we have another thing in common. I went to broadcasting school. Mm. <laughs> and I got to broadcasting school, which was full of a whole pile of very eclectic people 
who wanted to get involved in media. One of the guys that I met was from the United Kingdom. There was a strange coincidence because my dad was from the United Kingdom. And we just kind of were attracted to each other by our sense of humor. He was also a real partier. Okay, so we went to his house one day. There was a bunch of us. We were having an afternoon pool party, and someone pulled out a joint. Oh my God! I said, I will never do drugs. I will never smoke pot. I will never touch that bad, evil weed. But in fact, I felt the pressure. I can't lie. I tried it, and I liked it. I can't describe why I liked it. I just did. I liked the feeling it gave me. But what I loved more than anything was the feeling of the group. You know, there's a bit of a stereotype here. Uh, like laughing a little bit, you know, getting hungry a little bit, but definitely a different level of thinking, okay? So we were sitting there. It was a long afternoon. It was beautiful. This guy had moved from England with 700 record albums, all from Europe. Remember, this was 1978. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have music sharing. The only way you could buy albums is if you went to an international seller. But he had all of these albums, and he introduced me to a guy that I'd sort of heard about called David Bowie. David Bowie, and uh, what, I mean, the albums, his cover art alone, right? The glitter, all of that. He was obviously bisexual, right? I'd never met anybody like that. My buddy Mike wasn't gay, but he was definitely flamboyant. And we were so loaded. At one point, he gave me a big hug, and he said, I knew we were going to be friends, man. I went, what do you like about me? He says, you remind me of David Bowie. I said, but I don't have any glitter on. He goes, no, man, you're authentic. If you want to be anything in your life, he called me Toes. That's my nickname. Toes, be authentic and be proud of who you are. My parents had told me that for 18 years, but it took a stone friend of mine from England playing David Bowie albums to make me look in a mirror and go, he's right. I will never let my lack of arms be my excuse for lack of success. I've never lost a job. I've never, I've never had to look for a job. They always showed up in my life. I've worked in different careers. I've been successful as a speaker and author. But here's the key a lot of people don't know. I'm also a musician. That music context is also what gave me a bit of an edge in my life. And I think the bottom line of what this all made me discover is that if we cannot learn to like ourselves the way we are, we cannot do anything. I mean, we can put on makeup, we can change our hair, we can buy new clothes, but our authenticity starts in our soul, right in the middle, where we live. And a lot of people have not yet come to the conclusion that they have a choice. So last point, I was in England speaking two years ago and a client of mine was a, a CEO of a company and he hired me to speak to his people. And at the end of the program, he got up and talked about something apparently he talks a lot about, and that is the letters E-R-O. Have you ever heard of E-R-O? No. Okay, so Jack Canfield is the author of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series, right? Him and Mark Victor Hansen. I'm not name dropping, but they're both acquaintances of mine, okay? Jack Canfield also wrote an excellent book called The Success Principles. I would recommend you read the success principles to the audience because he comes up with a lot of clues about what makes someone successful. Apparently, I had been living E-R-O and didn't know it because I never read Jack's book. I just did it. It was something I'd always done. So here's what E-R-O stands for. And if your audience wants to write this down, this is a gem and I'm not, I want to make sure Jack gets credit, but I'm the one that was living it according to the CEO buddy of mine in the United Kingdom. So E is the event. R is the response, and O is the outcome. Now, what you do to fix it to my style is E is the event, but now you take a plus or minus response. Plus or minus. Plus attitude, minus attitude. Positive attitude, negative attitude. Every time you apply positive thinking to an event, you will get a different outcome than negative thinking. It's absolute brain science. There's nothing mystical about this. This is not me being stoned, <laughs> okay? This is absolute science. You can look it up because our brains can be measured when we have positive energy, it's all lit up. It's endorphins, and yes, that's what drugs does artificially. But we can create the same high 
in our lives without drugs by thinking in positive terms. And the more positive effect we put in our system, the healthier we are. In fact, I'm going to say something that's going to get, I'm sure, not exactly the kind of reaction that I would prefer. But I believe, for example, we will never find a cure for cancer, ever. In our history, ever, we will never find a cure. Because cancer, to me, is also caused by negative thinking, caused by negative emotions, caused by brooding, and caused by depression. And our body just starts to get unhealthy. I'm not suggesting that we can cure cancer by having a positive attitude. I'm saying that we can not get it in the first place by having a positive outlook. Right, right. Well, and I think they've done studies even where for every minute you're angry, it shaves off seconds of your life. Like your life expectancy actually decreases the more angry you are. And yeah, and, and, and Polly, if I may add right now to that line, right now people are thinking, but I've got a reason to be angry right now. Okay, you know what? I disagree. This racism has been with us forever. And by the way, it'll never stop. Because you can't make someone think the way you want unless they choose to think the way they should. I mean, it's just the way it is. I'm not suggesting we give up. That's not what I'm saying. But we have to pick our battles. And I think the trouble with what's going on right now, here's a perfect example, Pauline. We're applying negativity to a negative situation. Guess what happens when you put two negatives together? You don't get a positive you get a double negative. So the more we protest, the more anger there's gonna be. We're not gonna get rid of racism by having protests. Oh, and by the way, we're supposed to be staying home uh, in isolation so we don't spread the COVID virus around the planet. And yet people are just willy-nilly going out and protesting because they're saying our lives are more important than, than this. Right, okay, I'll acknowledge that. Your lives do matter. George Floyd's life mattered. I'm not gonna go there, by the way. But the fact of the matter is, people right now are, are really doing a disservice to the health of our planet by protesting something that will never stop. I'm just sorry, this is the way it is. I can only relate in terms of you know, having a disability, right? When we yeah. walk into a room, we're not gonna change people's first reactions to us. We're not gonna, um, like we, there's, we have no power over how someone sees us or thinks about right. us or judges us in the first encounter. Now that could shift as we get to know them and they get to know us, but that really starts with us, right? Like we, we control, we can control the conversation. You said this in our pre-call, we train people how to treat us in every encounter one-on-one. -on -one. Absolutely. In fact, uh, let me, I want to. This is a very important point, Pauline. Thanks for bringing this up. I hate to interrupt you, but this is really powerful stuff. A lot of people that I know on social media, in particular, are really legitimately saying, Mr. Alvin Law, what do you know about being black? You're white. You're right. I don't know anything about being black. But how about this idea? And I wonder if you've ever thought about this, Pauline. Black people are one form of minority, okay? But here's the deal. I get stared at by everybody. I get stared at by white people. I get stared at by brown people. I get stared at by Asian people. I get stared at by black people. I get stared at by every single faction of our society stares at me and makes me feel like I'm not whatever. You pick the word, okay? That's what I've grown up with. You too. Yet, why am I not mad? Because I've chosen it. And yes, Okay, here's another one. This is not original. In fact, what's interesting is we can't quite figure out who said this the first time. Some people claim Jim Rohn said it the first time. Some people claim Tony Robbins invented it. I have no idea. But the simple thought is you become who you spend time with. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, if you're spending time with everybody else in your life who's bitter, yeah, you're going you're gonna to fit right in and everyone's going to get along. That's what I believe is the source of the problem right now with race relations, is there's too many people that are angry at life and they're hanging out together. So in their minds, the entire world is screwed. I disagree. I believe the world, in fact, here's another real honesty. What I've been witnessing because I'm a people watcher is the pandemic, at least in my city of Calgary, Alberta, has made almost every single interaction I've had with people more pleasant since March 17th. Really? I've seen it. People, well, they're just nicer. They're more polite. They're holding doors. They're waiting in line. They're, 
they're respecting social distancing, they're, they're out in public respecting each other because we're all in this together. And then we have a, a caught murder, a black guy, and all of a sudden everything gets forgotten about how we were getting along. Mm. Human beings aren't meant to live in a cave. Okay, we, we left caves a long, long time ago, but we've been pushed into one and we've been choosing to react. Okay, the fact of the matter is, I agree, we need to stop racism. And maybe this is a way to help people think they're helping. But the fact of the matter is, the only way we stop racism is if everybody themselves looks in a mirror and asks the tough question, how do I honestly feel about black people? And let's remember, racism is just about black people. It's about all the different minorities that we see in our mind. You know, I gotta tell you, it was fascinating to work in Uganda, to be there for two weeks, many years ago now, my wife and I went. I was at a Rotary International Convention and Darlene and I were the only white people anywhere you could see. Did I feel intimidated? Not even a little bit. I learned to appreciate black culture from Africa. And by the way, this is gonna sound pretty callous. I didn't meet anybody in Uganda who was blaming themselves and their blackness on their lives. They were celebrating being black because that's what Africans do. That's all I'm saying. Right, right. So if someone's stuck in a negative label or a negative story, you know, and I really appreciate, you know, I know you keep apologizing, but what you're doing is you're giving us tough love, which is what created us to be so amazing. Right. So um, it's important that that we are able to speak honestly and and tell be authentic and truthful and transparent yeah. with our our thoughts um, from a place of love, though. Right. Everything we say that we're saying here is, is from a place of love. And I also want to make one more point before you, you know, go in. But um, if you are surrounded by family members who are negative and friends who are negative and you're just uh you know it just doesn't seem like there's anyone positive around you that you can get to you can watch episodes like this you can go and watch videos of alvin on you know goldcast and on his website you can podcast you know there's so many ways to feed your your soul and your mind with positivity that it that yes i truly believe that who you hang out with definitely influences you but you get to say who who do you hang out with who and it's not a physical thing it's how do you invest your time and yeah. energy in order yeah and i want to be clear pauline by the way sorry to interrupt you but i think i want to be clear that this is not just hanging around with like-minded people so you don't ever have to have a debate that's not what i'm talking about right. that, that to me is the major source of the problem with the internet is if we don't uh, like what somebody's thinking we just block them right that's that that's not what i'm talking about here uh, my marriage, first time round, is a perfect example, all right? One, I, I don't want to dwell on this, but one could argue, how did you get with this gal? How do we ever make a mistake in a relationship? I was young. What did I know? Okay, she was a cutie. What did I know? And I was attracted, you know, and all that stuff. The fact of the matter is, she turned into this horribly negative person. But I really did notice, more than anything, the people she was hanging out with were also really negative people. So I was sucked into this vacuum, right? And I, and I chose to get out. You know, a lot of people, when I was talking about divorce, I wasn't, by the way, let's be clear on this. I didn't say divorce is always bad. Okay, sometimes divorce can be really, really good. All right, for Darlene and me both, our divorce allowed us to meet. Mm -hmm. And now we've been together this long, right? It's actually, we met in 1991, so that's how long we've actually been together. But the fact of the matter is, I did something when I left my marriage the first time around. I spent a Sunday afternoon in my new little apartment, calling every single friend that we together, my ex-wife now and I had had in the time we lived together, and told them that I would not be associating with them anymore. That I would not talk to them if I saw them on the street. That I wouldn't answer the phone if it rang and it was their name. That I would not acknowledge them ever again for the rest of my life. And they didn't like hearing that. And then I made another set of phone calls after that set calling all my friends that had abandoned me because they couldn't stand being around the negative energy of my then wife. All right, I should have known better, but I didn't know better. Now, I wanna be very clear about this because yeah, we're supposed to be talking about love. Most of the women out there that may be listening to this that are, might be in an abusive relationship, don't stay. 
you on your safety and the safety of your children is more important than you clinging to a man because you're trying to either be loyal or you're desperate because you do not believe you can make it. You and I, Pauline, are perfect examples that you can do this. Mm -hmm. And that's about the label. Let's get back to your question about the label. I grew up with my mom way before Goldcast gave me a video. My mom used to say the words, labels are for jars, not people. She used it the whole time I was growing up. And it wasn't a coincidence. There was a root cellar, we called it, down in our basement that held all the stuff that my mom canned. And there's labels on everything. Mom always talked about it. Those labels are for jars, Sal. Those labels are for jars. When you get that into your psychology, then you can realize that labels are for jars, that they don't properly describe people. But here's the problem. Too many people use the label on themselves. It's a negative label, not one that other people are giving them. They give it to themselves. So where this came from, by the way, to change the label, that happened in my Goldcast video. And by the way, please, yes, go to alvinlaw.com and check it out in seven minutes. It's excellent. It's had over 41 million views on Facebook alone. It's been incredible. But the point is they, they, they got a speech of mine from a cable network in the Okanagan of British Columbia, Canada. I was speaking to a fundraiser for the Boys and Girls Clubs. And while I was talking to the Boys and Girls Clubs audience, what I was suggesting to them, which is what I've done my whole life when it comes to raising funds or donating to charity or being a part of charitable causes, I say, don't give out of sympathy. Give out of empathy. The two words do not connect. Empathy is understanding someone's life and respecting it. And for boys and girls clubs, they exist because so many of their kids are marginalized. Again, they didn't ask to be marginalized in their after school programs. They're positive, they're wonderful. And my comment in that video came out of nowhere. It was simply, these kids don't need our sympathy. They just need to change their label and see their future different. That's what it's all about. We can, I, I've done it, you've done it. You know, do you acknowledge, do you walk around going, hey, I'm handicapped? Of course not, because that's not how you think. Yet people look at us and go, but you are. Which part? Which part of us is handicapped, Pauline? I mean, that's the part that bugs me the most. You know, people would meet my wife, uh, and, in, uh, you know, I'd meet a friend of my wife's uh, when we were dating, and then she would, you know, introduce them to my, her new boyfriend. And you could sort of look at the, their face going, you left a stud cop for this? because they're not looking at the right thing. What we need to look at is not the person's body. We need to look into the person's eyes because mm -hmm. eyes are the portals to the soul. And my eyes are what made my husband fall in love with me. So <laughs> there you go. Exactly. You're lovely. And again, you know, beauty is subjective, isn't it? That's the bottom yeah. line. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's so much treasures and gold nuggets that you have brought up uh, to our audience. And I wanted to um, just dig a little bit deeper of that person who's just like pitying themselves, like really. And I, and I know you're saying it through the stories, yeah. um, like how we choose to see ourselves is our choice. Um, but there are people who just don't see that as an option. Is there anything you would say to them? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's two things. First of all, you mentioned it earlier, and I want to acknowledge that. There are so many books online, if you don't want to go to a library or a bookstore, about other people that have been through life. Read Nelson Mandela's autobiography. I mean, there's a, one, a perfect example. Hey, read uh, uh, Michelle Obama's new book, Becoming. Read that. Read other people's stories of what they've been through. Read Michael Jordan's story. Read LeBron James's story. Read some other people's stories. Read, read about Martin Luther King. He was one of my heroes growing up. People say, how did you end up having a hero who was a black civil rights leader in white Canada and rural Saskatchewan with no arms? Because my dad would read the newspaper and he would read stories. This was the 60s. Remember where we are now. And my dad would, I always remember this. I was like five or six years old. I can't remember exactly when, but I'm sure your audience will be able to look it up exactly when this came out. When Martin Luther King gave the speech about character being more important than color of skin, that resonated with me because it, it, it helped me understand I'm not defined by my body. My exterior does not say who I am, all right? The first time my mom took me to a school to get me to go to public school in 1966, this is one of my favorite stories. 
Mom and dad thought they were just going to a typical meeting before you got to sign up for education, right? Six years old in this case, because we didn't have kindergarten. The school was right across the street from our house. Can you believe that? So we walk into the school and we meet the principal and we sit down in his office and he just looks at us and says, he can't come to this school. And my dad goes, we live across the street. And he says, I know Mr. Law, we know where you live. We know your story, you're famous in town almost. But he can't come to this school because he needs to go to the school across town for kids like him. Mom went, kids like who? Principal pointed and said, crippled kids like him. Mom looked at me, I swear to God, and said, he's not crippled. Principal looked at my mom like she was something wrong with her too. Mrs. Law, he's got no arms. What do you call that? Mom went, Alvin. Mm. But here was the next part of the story. The principal said, I'm sorry, ma'am, sir. There's nothing I can do. So talk about a collision of a moment. My father was six feet, three inches tall when he was alive. 235 pounds, ex-professional heavyweight boxer, but more importantly, a service manager for a farm implement dealership in my hometown. My father never used the words, there's nothing I can do, ever, because there's always something we can do. So my dad and this man had a private conversation. We were asked to leave. Mom and I had to leave. I often joke, I thought my dad beat up the principal. <laughs> but that's kind of the point. My dad also taught me that violence doesn't fix anything. Nothing. I'm sorry. Violence doesn't fix anything. So they had a conversation. You know, let's be honest. This was 1966. It was mano a mano. My dad kind of challenged him, said, come on, give it a shot. Give it a try. What have you got to lose? If he doesn't make it, he'll go across town. And then I ended up graduating with honors from high school and college. Why? Because I'm smart. Yes. You get smart when you're handicapped. A lot of people don't think that. They think it's a mental impairment as well. Disagree. We are, we are so good at adapting, right? We're so good at inventing. We're so good at creating. We're so good at problem solving. We're so good at understanding other people's challenges. And more than anything, I don't know about you, Pauline. I bet you this one's true. We live in gratitude. Yes. Because we're so lucky to have what we have left, right? Yes. Gratitude. That's the key. Yes. Gratitude. I, yeah, I, 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 I can go off about gratitude. I feel like is the key to everything because when you're in that state, you know, and I teach in my online course, belief breakthroughs, I teach, there's a frequency um, table and gratitude is right under enlightenment in the, in the frequency scale. And so um, when, you know, you attract, like attracts like, right? And so when you're in a space of gratitude, you just get more of everything you're grateful for. And, you know, I didn't know it. I feel like, you know, you said you were, you didn't know it, but you were living out ERO. Um, yeah. All these, these universal principles of ERO, gratitude, um, tough love, like everything that we are talking about this in this one interview is not new and we but we've had more practice with them like we just live them naturally and so if it's not natural natural to you the viewer who's watching this right now if you feel like gratitude is just not natural to you maybe your mode of operation is negativity and, and like you know there are different personalities out there in the world you know some may have just been more and more positive. I don't know, but I do know that we each have a choice in this. And you said something earlier. Oh, it was so important. Um, oh, and I, it just, it, it left me right now. Because well, let me, let me, Pauline, just to interrupt you for a sec so you can think about it. Let me give you my perfect example from a personal story. Okay, this is proof that anybody can change. Now, I'll grant you this one. Maybe I can change better because I teach people to do it. I don't know. But we moved to Calgary in 2000, all right? We moved from a small town in Saskatchewan to a big city of Alberta, okay? We happened by circumstance, although I don't think there's any coincidences. We ended up purchasing a home that was way bigger than what we needed, but we got lucky because it was a, had to be sold by the end of this one day because it was part of a divorce agreement. 
So we literally stole it. I mean, not literally, but you know what I mean? Like we got such a good deal on this house, but we moved into a neighborhood way beyond my pay grade. Okay. So in our neighborhood, there's, there's huge homes. Our home alone is 3,500 square feet. Okay. The homes around us, there's Ferraris, there's Lamborghinis, there's Mercedes. One day early on in the time we moved to Calgary, I pulled up next to my dream car the Aston Martin Vanquish. The guy next to me, and I'm looking down at him because I'm in an SUV, he's got his sunroof open, he's revving the motor, he's wearing a polo shirt with the pony on the chest, and he had it all going on, right? And he's listening to rap music and he's white. And I'm trying to figure out how to feel about this, but what I said, pardon my grammar, under my breath with my wife sitting next to me, I hope the bastard hits a tree and dies. My wife looked at me and said, what did you just say? I said, I didn't say anything. She goes, I heard what you said. What I'm asking is, what did you just say? I can't believe you said that. So here's a poem that we talked about earlier. Darlene and I had a husband and wife thing for the rest of the day, right? Finally, after everything calmed down, I said, what were you so mad about? She goes, you should be happy for him. And I'm going, what? Why would I be happy for a guy driving an Aston Martin? She says, it's called sympathetic joy. If you cannot be happy for someone else's happiness or success, they win a lottery, you should be happy for them, not jealous. I thought about it for a while. I thought it was the stupidest thing I ever heard in my entire life. I swear to God, two weeks later, I happened to be at a boat dealership because I happened to have a boat. And a guy pulled in with an antique Mercedes Gullwing. They're probably worth about $500,000, right? He gets out. I went over. My son was with me. Walked over to talk to him. I started practicing what Darlene had taught me. I walked over and I said, that's the most beautiful car I've ever seen in my life, man. Congratulations. You should have seen the look on his face. I said, that, how, that's God, how did you manage to find that? Oh, he said, I went to the Barrett Jackson automobile auction in, in uh, Phoenix or Scottsdale technically, and it's my dream car. He said, I sold my business last year. I've been a workaholic my whole life, and my wife told me I could buy two toys. So this is the first one, and I'm coming to pick up my other toy today, a new boat. And I said, congratulations, buddy. And I said, that is so beautiful. I hope nothing but the best for you. And he kind of looked at me. I'm not making this up, Pauline. He said, what do you mean? I said, I'm just telling you congratulations. He goes, that's rare. I said, what? He goes, people usually look at me like they want me to hit a tree and die. I swear to God, he said those words. All of a sudden, what my wife taught me made sense. This change we're talking about is available to every single human being. I won't tell you how to do it, but here's one more that I left out. If you think your life is bad, go volunteer for someone that has a worse life. Okay, go visit a homeless shelter. Go visit a, a, a pet kennel. Go visit a, a, a humane society. I mean, go, go visit a senior's facility, although you can't right now. But you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Give of yourself the time that you have to volunteer for a cause that means something to you. You will meet like-minded, caring, giving people. And that will make you reevaluate how you see yourself. Or even simpler, okay? Just go for a walk. You know, go for a walk in the woods. Go for a walk on the beach. I know you can do that there. And one of the reasons this is so incredible to me is not because it's a cottage on a lake. There's water there. I can feel its energy. We're tied together. We're water people, human beings. Mm -hmm. So do something to give yourself a feeling of bliss, whatever that looks like, okay? It doesn't take much to change a little bit of character every day and reinvent yourself if you need to. But I suggest reinvention is not the right word. It's just invention, period. You're right. We're creating our own story, Pauline. We're the only author. The only people that we need to look at when it comes to what goes wrong in our life is what we see when we look in a mirror. Stop blaming other people and start taking this on yourself. Yeah. And I remember what I was going to say, um, and I wanted to pose it to our audience as we close down this interview. Um, when your dad confronted the principal and said, well, what if you just try? Like, what would that look like? Right? And so yes. to our viewer, viewer, what if you just try? What, what if, you know, you got up? And what if you didn't give up? Because on the other side of that, 
you don't know what you're actually giving up when you act, when you give up, you know, you don't know that you could have that dream cottage on that lake you grew up on and pass it on to your family. You know, you don't know what's possible if you give up. So what if you got up and actually changed the label and your story and took responsibility for the story you're writing and say, I'm the author and I am going to write a new story. So I have a tip for your audience, Pauline. Thank you. And I know we're running out of time. Yes. Ask your audience. I will ask them for you. How do you begin every day? Do you begin by grabbing your phone off the side counter? By the way, Feng Shui says never, ever put electronics in your bedroom. Not even a television, Pauline. No electronics. You don't put your cell phone by your bed because it's bad for you. It's not just the fact that it's a distraction, okay? But there's actual energy that comes out of it. It's called EMF energy. It's the noise you hear when you go under a power line in a car with the radio on. That's coming out of your phone. I'm not trying to scare anybody, okay? But we have kids who sleep with their cell phones and check them in the middle of the night as if they're missing something. That's a terrible habit, the fear of missing out, the FOMO thing, right? Horrible habit. Don't turn on the news when you wake up. Don't look at the internet and check out what's going on. How many protests are happening today? How many people died of COVID today? Do not watch TV or the media. Don't listen to it. I'm not talking about avoidance. But you and I know we were trained in the media. It's changed. The media that you and I know is not the same as the media that we, that we have today. The media today is all about negativity. It's all about making the world seem horrible. The environment is killing our planet. I agree the environment's changed, but we're not dying next week unless we get sick from COVID, which we won't do if we stay home. See what I mean? Just be in your cocoon. And I know it's a scary thing for some people right now. I get it, I get it, I get it. But don't get sucked into the negativity energy coming out of the media. You know, right. watch this interview. Watch your other podcasts. You've got great shows. Watch all the shows you put out. Look for other positive webinars and podcasts. They're everywhere nowadays. And more than anything, one last time, remember, your life is not a mistake. Your life is a creation waiting to happen. Mm, beautiful. Beautifully said. I, am, I feel like that's the mic drop in the show. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Um, Alvin, I do want... Uh, to give our audience members an opportunity to uh, take you take you home into their own homes. After this interview is done, there's still ways to connect with Alvin and there's ways to just bathe yourself in the positivity and the tough love and principles that he shares. And you have a book. What is it called? Alvin's Laws of Life. That's darn clever, Pauline. My name is Alvin Law. Alvin's Law is a life. Oh, and the better part, five steps to successfully overcome anything. Mm. Somebody once said to me, that's, that's pretty egotistical. If you read your book, you can overcome anything. No, if you read the book, nothing will happen. But if you do what's in the book, yes, you can overcome anything. But look at, this isn't just about me. Sometimes I feel like it's me. You know, look at me, look at me, look at me. Look what I've done. Look at you, Pauline. Look what you've done. You know, you've had other guests on your program that have done amazing things. If you're not paying attention to the proof, people, you're not paying attention. Mm, wow. Oh, my gosh. That is amazing. If you're not paying attention to the proof, you're not paying attention. Gosh, Lavin, thank you so much. I, I thank so you, Pauline. appreciate you um, just gracing my show and the people that are going to watch this with such wisdom. It's, it, it, it's palpable. It really is. So thank you. Thank you. I, I would clap if I could, but I can't. <laughs> I'll clap for you. Okay. I love it. <laughs> I thought we were going to connect there, <laughs> but you can do it too. <laughs> all right. All I can say is aloha from the bottom of my heart and mahalo to all of the Hawaiians watching and more than anything, uh, thank you, sister. I have a new friend that lives in the beautiful paradise gliding of where you live, but more than anything, you said it. We're joined via wonderful technology, and this is available to everybody. Don't feel lost and alone, folks.
because we're all in this together. I know that's a cheesy expression, but I want to say it. We're in this together. God yeah. bless. Mahalo. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, audience, for tuning in. I want to encourage you to subscribe and share. This has been full of so many treasures. It would be a shame for you not to spread the light through this episode. Share with your families and friends, anyone who's going through a hard time and they just feel like giving up, there's a way out and there's a way up. And I hope this episode can be a part of that journey for anyone that feels hopeless. So thank you. If you want to join my private Facebook group, you can do that. It's called Victoriously Living. And if you'd like to see more from One Leg Up Productions, please support us at patreon.com forward slash One Leg Up Productions. Thank you so much. And until we meet again, be blessed. Mm -hmm.